It is a good morning to gather together and to sing the Lord's praises. Amen. Amen. Again, I want to say thank you to everybody that helped with sports camp this past week. Uh, we couldn't do it without the volunteers that make it possible. It's a group effort and well worth it to see our own kids and many others hear the gospel. And as has been mentioned already this morning, the work isn't done. We need to be praying that the seeds that were planted this week will grow and that the Lord would give us wisdom to follow up with the kids that we've ministered to. And so with that in mind, let's send our little ones off to kids' church. They'll make their way out. And the rest of us, let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. We'll finish off this study of the armor of God that we began a few short weeks ago. It's honestly my favorite part of the whole day. It's so great. All right, Ephesians 6. Let me remind you of where we are, just for some context. The Apostle Paul is writing while under house arrest. He's, he's in Rome. He's writing to the church at Ephesus, and he writes to remind them of essential Christian doctrine and essential Christian behavior in light of that doctrine. While writing, Paul is chained with a halicist. It's about six feet long. And on the other end of that chain is a member of the Praetorian Guard, the elite of the elite Roman soldiers. He would have very quickly become familiar with the armor that they wore. And he uses that armor as a metaphor for how the Lord's equipped the Christian for the spiritual battle that we find ourselves in. We've seen this first thing he mentions as a belt of truth that binds up the loose folds of our life so that we can run for the Lord. We've seen how the breastplate of righteousness shields the vital organs of our thoughts and our emotions. We're protected there by trusting in the Lord. We've seen the boots or the shoes of the gospel of peace by which we're able to take and keep ground for the Lord as we proclaim the gospel message that people are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. We've seen the shield of faith by which we're able to extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy that might cause us to fear or panic. These things that may set us ablaze with temptation are put out as we trust in the Lord and His Word. We've seen the helmet of salvation we know that we're protected. Our identity is that we belong to Christ above anything else, and nothing can separate us from Him. All of these have been primarily defensive, though. They've been for our protection. But as the saying goes, sometimes the best defense is a good offense. And so we come to the final implement of the armor of God, the sword of the Spirit. Before we pick up a sword and go hacking and slicing, though, let's realize the truth of this quote that's somewhat ironically attributed to John Calvin. Zeal without doctrine is like a sword in the hand of a lunatic. Zeal without doctrine is like a sword in the hand of a lunatic. And if you don't know why that's somewhat ironic, just Google John Calvin and Servetus. He executed him with a sword. Anyway, the Roman army was trained to fight with swords, and they trained a lot. This was the largest professional army in the world at that time, in the history of the world. In training, these guys would use wooden swords that were twice as heavy so that they could become strong and proficient swordsmen. And they weren't part-time. They weren't weekend warriors. They were professional soldiers. They fought and they trained. They did their duty and they trained to do it better and that's it. Once a sea captain came ashore after a long time out at sea, 
and he ran into an old friend. And his friend said, hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. You look terrible. What happened? And the captain says, oh, I'm fine. What are you talking about? The friend says, yeah, but you've got a peg leg and a hook for a hand and an eye patch. You didn't have those before. He says, oh, well, my leg got hit with a cannonball and I lost my hand in a sword fight, but that's okay because I got fitted with this really fancy hook. And the friend says, and, and your eye patch? And he just sort of hangs his head and says, well, it was a beautiful day at sea and a flock of seagulls flew, over, flew overhead and I made the mistake of looking up at them. <laughs> The friend says, you didn't lose your eye to bird droppings. No way. And he goes, you're right. It was my first day with the hook. <laughs> the moral of the story, sharp objects in untrained hands cause damage. That's why we don't give them to children. The Romans committed their lives to training. And unless we understand the good swordsmanship that would have been in mind as Paul makes this analogy, we too run the risk of zeal without doctrine. Sharp objects in untrained hands. We too may be sloppy and careless with the Word of God. We too may be lunatics with swords. A sword is a powerful implement. It can serve many good purposes, but again, there's a reason we don't give them to children. There's no counting the damage that's been done by well-meaning people who have used Scripture poorly. Let's talk about the physical weaponry that Paul would have had in mind. There's actually two different Greek words that are translated as sword in the New Testament. They were very different, though, and knowing which one Paul has in mind makes a big difference. One of those words is rumphaya. It speaks of a long sword or a javelin. It's the image that comes to mind when we think of, of a sword. It's single-edged. It's ideal for slicing and chopping. It's what an executioner would pick up if he were to behead someone who was condemned. It would function in hand-to-hand -hand combat as a slashing weapon. Again, that word can also refer to a, a spear, that spear-looking thing that we typically see depicted in artwork and movies about Roman soldiers, that, that long javelin that they would throw. So the other word that's translated as sword in the New Testament is makara. You guys want to say that out loud? It's fun to say. You don't? Makara. And that's, that's the word that Paul uses here. It's a word that refers to a large knife or a short sword, depending on the context. Roman soldiers carried that long javelin, but belted around their waist was the Roman short sword. It was a very formidable weapon. They referred to it as a gladius. The gladius was about 18 inches long, double-edged, with a spear point. The gladius would have been carried on the right hip, the shield would have been in the left hand, and they could draw the sword with a real short flicking motion. If the sword was too long, the shield would have been in the way. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes in verse 17, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword, or the short sword, of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's that word, makara. If he's drawing inspiration from the armor and armaments of a Roman soldier that he's chained to, he could have referenced the javelin. He has a word for it. But instead he says we should draw the short sword. It's the gladius that we're to take up in being battle ready. As a weapon, the gladius is one of the most formidable in history. This type of sword was used in hand-to-hand -hand combat to stab at an enemy. The typical strike would have been in the abdominal area, since in that day an abdominal, uh, abdominal, abdominal wound would have almost always been fatal. Remember I told you before that the Roman soldiers were very disciplined on the battlefield. They never raised their arms above their head. They fought in a unit 
They fought in a formation. They were trained never to raise their arms because if they did so, they would expose the one weakness in their armor. The gladius wasn't a, 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 a slashing weapon as much as it was, it was followed up with a strike from that scutum, that big square shield, that door-shaped shield, and they would stab right behind it. The Roman army would maintain a defensive posture until the enemy would raise his arms. Then he would thrust the, the gladius quickly and accurately. Each strike aimed at a specific target, directed exactly there with the thrust and delivered with as much precision and force as possible. The sharp point of the gladius widened to that broad, double-edged blade, and it would utterly destroy vital organs, leaving fatal wounds. The grooved handle... You see there in the picture, it fits neatly in his hand. You've, you've seen it in movies. It almost like grooves half as deep as the finger. It gave that soldier a firm enough grip where he could puncture through a lot of primitive, primitive armor. <laughs> Historians estimate that the gladius in the hands of disciplined Roman soldiers was the deadliest of all ancient weapons. This sword has killed more soldiers than any weapon in human history until the invention of the modern rifle. This sword is also used all throughout Scripture. It's the type of sword that Peter would have used when, the, when he chopped the ear off of the high priest's servant in Matthew 26. It's the type of sword used by Herod's executioners in Acts 12 when James was martyred. Beyond its use as a weapon, it had a lot of practical uses in the field as well. It had some utility to it. So it's not just a weapon, it's a tool. While on a campaign, the Roman army would build fortified camps, and they would build a whole camp in a few hours. And they had specialty tools for construction. They had shovels and smaller knives for processing meat and other camp chores. But if you've ever done any camping, you know the value of a good blade in the wilderness. Because the gladius was short, it wasn't unwieldy. It could be utilized in many ways. It's not, it's not hard to imagine the potential uses of an 18-inch double-edged blade without a lot of tip weight. I mean, it sounds ideal for clearing brush. It could easily serve as a tool for splitting wood. It could be used for leveraging or prying heavy objects. Now, history has a lot more to say about its use as a weapon, but we can obviously identify several practical uses, and that's important because as we get to the spiritual application of the sword, it's obvious that the sword in Paul's mind is both an offensive weapon and a practical tool. He says that this sword is the Word of God. But pay attention to what else Paul wrote about the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So here we see the Word of God is something that builds up. It's utility. It's a tool. Then we read in Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So it's clear from Scripture that this is a, a dual-purpose implement. It's a weapon and a tool. It's, it's wartime and utility. The Word of God cuts, Hebrew, Hebrews 4. The Word of God builds, 2 Timothy 3. So the spiritual application of this analogy begins to make itself evident here. The Word of God is a powerful weapon in a spiritual battle against the enemy. Now, there's four Greek words that are translated as word or saying in our English Bible. Logos and rhema are the two most common, but they mean slightly different things. First of all, 
a logos refers to the totality of the word of God, like the whole thing, the, the whole counsel, all of it. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, that's logos, and the word was with God and the word was God. We see it used in Matthew 7, at the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 28 and 29. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. That's referring to all the things he said, the totality of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. The other word commonly used is rhema. Rhema refers to a specific statement rather than the totality of what was said. We read in Mark 9, 31 and 32, for example, For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. But they did, under, they did not understand this saying. See how it's specific? That, that's a different word. That word translated there as saying is rhema. It's different than logos. Rhema is a, it specifically refers to one thing Jesus said, not the entirety of everything he said. So that's the difference. The entirety versus a specific utterance of the word. So when, when Paul says, take up the sword of the Spirit, it is the word of God, we need to know which one he's using. Is it, the, 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 just do, we, do we, we pick it up and start in Genesis 1 and, and read to the end of the book? We face a very specific spiritual need in a very, very particular situation. And we go, well, something in here will cover it. Or is it, is it the word fitly proclaimed for that particular circumstance that we're dealing with? So we come back. This short sword is meant for hitting a specific target. And Paul uses the word rhema. He says, the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. It's the word proclaimed. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God proclaimed. When in the midst of spiritual attack, the battle-ready Christian is the one who's prepared to wield the Word of God in proclamation of the specific passages that deal fatal wounds to the lies of the enemy. Like the skilled swordsmen of the Roman army, we must be trained to know which passages of the Bible speak powerfully and directly to the situation at hand. And we must be willing to pro proclaim the Word of God in that place and in that moment. Here's an example of why knowing the difference is really important. I have an image on this next screen that I want to show you guys. This has been making its way around social media. It's been shared a lot of times with the goal of somehow being encouraging or giving people some sort of hope that if they just put God first, He'll bless them or something along those lines. If therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Doesn't that sound super encouraging? If you'll worship me, all shall be thine. It, it's only encouraging until you know the context. Satan said that to Jesus to tempt him. This is someone just grab-bagging something out of the Bible without regard to context. This is an example of a sword in the hands of a lunatic. Staying within that same example, in that moment where Satan is tempting Jesus, Jesus wields the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God proclaimed perfectly. 
Satan tempts him with food. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. Satan tempts him with adoration. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6.16. Satan tempts him with riches. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6.13. Just precision each and every time puncturing those lies with the word of God proclaimed. Jesus cuts the heart out of each and every attack of the enemy with skill and precision. It's no hack job. It's surgical. It's precise. We must be so familiar with the, the logos, the whole of it, that we can pull out the things we need in that specific moment and proclaim it. We need to know the big picture so that we can use the sharp points and edges with skill in the spiritual battle that we find ourselves in. But there's this temptation, right, to just grab hold of anything that feels like it fits our circumstances and start swinging. We have to fight against that temptation, that, that temptation to personalize everything we read in Scripture. Don't get me wrong. Scripture is personal. It is applicable. It is specific. It does deal with everything that we'll face as the people of God. But the application of the Bible does not come from what we think it means. It doesn't come from what we hope it means. The application of Scripture isn't subject to our feelings or our emotions either. Even with our cultural understanding of words and concepts, we've got to get that out of the way. Here's a rule of thumb. If what we think a passage means could not have meant what we think it means to its original audience, then it does not mean what we think it means. I'll go over that again. If what we think a passage means could not have meant what we think it means to its original audience, it does not mean what we think it means. People reading current events into Scripture. Well, could it have meant that to a first century Jew? No. Then it doesn't mean that. Are there lessons? Are there application points? Sure. Are there parallels? Yeah. But if we come to a different conclusion than what the original audience could have received, we're wrong. We, we take things out of context to fit the geopolitical debates of today. If what we think a passage means couldn't have meant what we think it means to the original audience, it does not mean what we think it means. The right application of Scripture comes from its historical and grammatical context. When the Word of God is accurately proclaimed, it brings hope to the hopeless. When the Word of God is accurately proclaimed, it exposes lies and sin. When the Word of God is ac accurately proclaimed, it brings life and salvation to the lost and dying. Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Again, that Greek word used there is rhema. In a spiritual battle, you and I must be people who wield this powerful sword of the word of God. And we need to be people who are skilled at cutting through the lies and the falsehood. We must be people who, with surgical precision, by the Word of God, can cut the sin out of our own lives and come alongside others to aid in that work as the Holy Spirit enables us. But in all of that, there's a skill and precision that comes from diligent study. Because zeal without doctrine is like a sword in the hands of a lunatic. Where context is ignored, confusion reigns. Where men play fast and loose with the text of the Bible, the people are in danger. Make no mistake. We would do well to heed the warning of 1 Peter 1, 20 and 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, 
But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Paul says, take up the word proclaimed as battle-ready representatives of our king in a spiritual battle. Our text says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. There's this seamless move from the word proclaimed to prayer. And it's vital, then, that we consider the Word of God in prayer. Biblical prayer is a potent and powerful offensive weapon in the spiritual battle we find ourselves in. He says, pray always. Pray for all the saints. And then in verses 19 and 20, he asks his friends in Ephesus to pray for him. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Then in it I may be, that, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. There's this admonition to proclaim the word. And then... Then there's this admission that that's hard to do. It's hard to find ourselves in a, in, a, in a set of circumstances where lies of the enemy, confusion, twisted, twisted messages, mixed metaphors, all sorts of things, even, even in a context of people that are supposed to be biblically literate, where, where we can pierce through that lie with the word fitly spoken, but doing so feels risky. It feels like conflict. It is. It's a war. Not against flesh and blood. We're not slicing and dicing at people, but we, we are. We are in a battle for truth. Against spiritual forces of wickedness. It takes boldness because it's war. Again, Paul says to open my mouth and make known the mystery of the gospel. That's proclamation. That's rhema all over again. There's this proclamation that sets captives free. It, it, it requires us to engage in a centuries-old war. And you say, well, you know, Pastor, I know I'm called to share my faith. I'm just too afraid. I'm just, I'm just too timid. Well, you're in good company, my friend. Because the Apostle Paul, who wrote like most of the New Testament, says, would you pray that I'd have boldness? Because I, I, he's timid. The Apostle Paul felt the same way. So let me encourage you in this. Put your armor on, pick up your sword, and pray for boldness. To proclaim that truth that sets captives free. The gospel message. And this isn't just Paul. We talk about the role of prayer. Let's, let's see prayer emboldened Jesus in Matthew 26. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless... Not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our, our flesh in this battle is weak. This is a spiritual war. So pray. Pray for me. Pray for yourselves. Pray for each other. Pray with each other. It's a practical tool that builds us up and gives us boldness 
to proclaim the word with surgical precision in a way that pierces the lies and sets people free. In general, the American church has let its sword become dull. Dull with neglect. We've become dull to staying sharp in the word in pursuit of entertainment or pleasure. Perhaps due to busyness and less important things. Perhaps it's because at the end of the day we just don't care enough. So let me ask you this because I love you. Are you staying sharp? When was the last time... In the middle of the week, you sat down and you said, Father, I need you to sharpen me. I need to know you more and I need to know your word more. So please quicken my mind and sharpen my senses that I might know your word and sharpen me as an instrument that's useful to you. And then after praying, you actually give yourself to training, to studying his word, to, to being equipped for battle. I mean, we, we, we give you tools for that. We provide this little guide in your bulletin. It's meant to help you. It's available to you. It's meant to aid in your study. I'm not saying that's the only tool or even the best one. I'm just saying it's a free one that you pick up every Sunday. What are we giving our time and attention to that takes us away from the, necess the necessary training that it takes to be battle ready? Do, do, we, do we need to be training to be battle ready? We're not, we don't like wake up one day like, I'm, I'm fit for duty. No. This is a constant thing. We're always growing. We're always becoming sharper, right? We may be in a scenario that we go, I don't know how to answer that, so I won't. But I'm going to go find out, and I'm going to get sharp, because the next time I encounter that lie, that sucker's coming down. And the more and more we do that, the more equipped we become, and the more effective we become for the Lord of glory in this battle that we find ourselves in. John MacArthur shares the following quote from H.P. Barber. As I looked out into the garden one day, I saw three things. First, I saw a butterfly. The butterfly was beautiful, and it would alight on a flower, and then it would flutter to another flower, and then another. And only for a second or two, it would sit, and it would move on. It would touch as many lovely blossoms as it could, but derived absolutely no benefit from it. Then I watched it a little longer out my window, and there came a botanist. And the botanist had a big notebook under his arm and a great big magnifying glass. The botanist would lean over a certain flower, and he would look for a long time, and he would write notes in his notebook, and he was there for hours writing notes. Then he closed them, stuck them under his arm, tucked his magnifying glass in his pocket, and walked away. The third thing I noticed was a bee. Just a little bee. But the bee would light on a flower, and it would seek, sink down deep into the flower, and it would extract all the nectar and pollen that it could carry. It went in empty every time and came out full every time. <coughs> MacArthur adds his own commentary to H.P. Barber. Some Christians are like that butterfly. They flit from Bible study to Bible study, from church to church, from sermon to sermon, from commentary to commentary, while gaining little more than a nice feeling and a few good ideas. Others, like the botanist, study Scripture carefully and take copious notes. They gain a lot of information, but little truth. Others, like the bee... Go to the Bible to be taught by God and to grow in their knowledge of Him. Also like the bee, they never go away empty. My friends, we must be people of the Word. We must be people that are ready for battle. We can have all the armor on. 
But if we're not equipped to accurately proclaim the word with boldness and precision, then we have work to do. That's an encouragement. We have work to do. We need to be more equipped. I need to be more equipped. There's lies that I come across that I'm like, I, I, I don't know. That's a hard one. So we put this armor on, but, but, but we need to be able to fight this fight with the one offensive weapon that we have, the Word of God proclaimed. So let's put the armor on with a couple points of application, shall we? One, be a people of prayer. Let's be a people of prayer. Now it's good to pray to simply thank God for His goodness and love. It's good to pray simply to have fellowship with our loving Father who desires fellowship with us. But let's not forget that when we pray, we bring petitions before the Almighty King of Kings and He moves on our behalf at His will. But quite often, simply because we ask. We have the privilege of interceding for our lost friends and family members, asking God to make himself known to them, asking God to give us both the words and the willingness to go to them in love and share with them the truth that delivers people from the grip of the enemy. And, and we don't take advantage of that. That's a, that's a privilege that we have that we don't avail ourselves of nearly as often as we should. <coughs> This is a spiritual battle. And therefore, it's a battle waged through the spiritual work of prayer. So pray for boldness. Jesus prayed for God's will to be done. In all of it, both Paul praying for boldness, Jesus praying for God's will to be done, there's a willingness to, pro to proclaim the truth, even when that truth is unpopular. We've got to be a people of prayer. And we've got to be a people of proclamation. The point of praying for that boldness is the boldness to actually open our mouth and proclaim the truth. Our role in this spiritual war isn't to be the arbiters of truth. It's not our job to go, well, you know, this part seems relevant for now, but, you know, that's sort of antiquated, and, you know, I don't really, we need to worry about that. Our role in this spiritual battle isn't to massage the truth into the cultural mindset. Our job is to be heralds of the Word of God on time and in context. God's job is results. Our job is to proclaim the gospel that Jesus died to save sinners, that he was raised to life again, and one day will return to judge the living and the dead. Our job is to announce that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And our God has supplied us with armor and weaponry that's more than sufficient for that task. So let's close in a word of prayer, church. Lord, thank you for arming us, preparing us for battle. Lord, it's easy to look at these things and imagine children playing dress up, putting on plastic armor. But the armor you give us is real. The war we're in is real. The danger is real. The enemy is real. The darts really do come. Real people really are held captive to the deception of the enemy. And their lies reflect that. Their lives reflect that. God, you've armored us and equipped us to be used by you in setting captives free. 
you guard our, our hearts and minds. You, you cleat our, our, our feet so that we can run and not slip. You, you give us truth that gets our own mess out of the way. So that we can sprint with all, all, the, all the loose folds of what we'd be apart from you entangling us. You give us your word. A very precise, formidable weapon. That pierces. Cuts straight to the heart of the deception that's so prevalent in our culture. So God, would you help us as a church to be battle ready, to be well armored. To put on the things you've given us. To, to know our identity in Christ and to diligently train to wield and proclaim your word accurately and on time. God, in that we pray that we'd see things that have been held captive for a long time. People who are, are being kept in darkness, loosed from the prison they're in to their sin, set free to walk in newness of life with you, to worship you, because you are worthy. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.